This episode contains discussions of domestic violence, child loss and suicide. If this raises any issues for you, support is available through the links and phone numbers in the show notes. It's August 2020 and Sophia Vorje has just given birth to her first child, a beautiful baby girl named Azalea. Sophia and her then partner Ashley Kane have been excitedly waiting for this day for months. Like all young families, they're excited to spend their lives together. But just eight weeks after this moment, Azalea is diagnosed with an aggressive form of leukemia. They've been in each other's lives for just eight precious months. I'm Matt Middleton, and this is Head Game. Today's story is one of the most painful that of losing a child and turning that intolerable loss into your life's purpose. Sophia, it's great to have you on Head Game. Now I've sort of hunted you down a little bit because uh, my wife is a huge fan um, of your mindset, a huge fan of who you are and gains massive inspiration from yourself and that's coming from the most respected woman in my life which is Emily Um, and she said you've got to get this girl on your podcast because when it comes to Head Game which is the name of the podcast um, I thought to myself I've got to get her on I've got to see how she's got through this or how she's making her way through this pain a lot of people know your story but not A lot of people know who you are. And that's what I want to touch on before we get on to um, Azalea and uh, that beautiful daughter of yours. Who are you? So hello and thank you so much for having me here today. It's incredible um, to be sat in front of you, actually. Um, Such an inspirational guy. And it's just so beautiful to hear that your wife um, is inspired by my mindset. That's so beautiful. Um, so I am Sophia Varaji and I am from Nuneaton, born and bred Nuneaton girl. So that's in the Midlands. Um, I was raised in a way where I watched my mum be a strong woman. Um, growing up wasn't easy, but I was always loved. Um, growing up, I had to unfortunately watch certain amounts of domestic violence, um, And it moulded me into a strong individual that I am today from such an early age. Unfortunately, I had to witness and watch things that no child should. Was that Um, with your mum and your dad or was that your mum being a single mum with boyfriends? How did that work? No, that was like mum with my dad. Yeah, and she made an incredible move by um, taking that change to become a single mum and look after myself and my brother to the point where... We was going out doing paper rounds together as children so we could keep the sky on. Um, She was working four jobs. Um, We had, she met my stepdad and he was a police officer. We then become a family through having a stepfather and my mom. So I had a father role in my life, which I'm so grateful for. And it wasn't easy. Yeah, it wasn't easy. So when this man came along, you sort of, reformed a new family unit, right? A new family bond. Did it feel like that you went from a broken family, then obviously your stepfather coming into your life? And did he make that, did he fix the gaps? Did he make that a family unit and a family bond? Yeah, he actually um, came in very gently, I'd okay. say. Like he what didn't, age were you? Um, around eight. Oh, so young. Yeah, very young. But um, unfortunately, I used to sit at the window and wait for my dad to come. Um, it was very painful and my mum didn't ever want to say no for me to see my dad, but I kind of had to learn the hard way. I had to learn that when I was asking for my dad, he wasn't available or he'd come to see me for 10 minutes in the car and just give me a pound to go and get some sweets. Or some days my mum would have to go out with my stepdad and then we're going to have a nice day and I'd be crying to want to stay at home, I feel emotional about this, to see my dad and I'd sit at the window all day. Um, until my mum had come back from going out shopping and he wouldn't turn up. So as a child, 
I longed for, although being so grateful of having my stepdad, I always longed for a father figure. Mm -hmm. When did you actually realise that he wasn't coming back? When you used to wait and wait? Was there a moment in your life where you thought, he's he's not coming, I can wait all I want, but he's not going to be there? It came to a point where I had to learn harder and harder, actually. Um, I'd be waiting at the window, and then it would get to the point where I'd be with his girlfriends, and he'd go out drinking. and he'd Just come... to be close to him? Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, so then I'd go and spend time with the girlfriends, but then the girlfriends of his would be so lovely and so nice and be really inclusive to me. And then he would go out and he would drink and then I would have to listen. I was getting older at this point, so I was listening to the verbal abuse. Um, I was listening um, on the hallways of what was being said. I would actually go down the stairs and try and pretend that I've gone downstairs to have a drink just to break the argument because I didn't want to hear, like, any, like, domestic violence going on yeah. or anything. And how did that affect your relationship growing up with, with men? Yeah, so I actually, when I could... When I was getting into that period where I was kind of wanting to date or liking guys, it was like I was—I loved it. I enjoyed it. It was something like I loved hugging. I loved that affection. And it's not until I'm older now and look and have therapy that I realise that I was craving that love, that hunger for just being held in a man's arms and feeling loved and protected was something that I desired the most and now I have therapy I realise that that's what I was actually searching for. And did you ever enter any sort of uh, abusive relationships? Did you ever fall into that thinking that that was normal? Yeah now I spoke about it touched on it gently actually in my book and I did I had one relationship for four years um, it's a long time. Yeah, it's a long time. And I actually have never spoke about it because it actually frightens me inside when I actually speak about it. There's just maybe areas of therapy that I need to work on there. But um, I was in a false sense of security looking back. I um, kind of leered into something where I felt like it was safe and I was being protected. The care, I didn't realise it was control. Um the protectiveness that I just wanted to feel like, oh my God, you care about me, you love me. It ended up being so controlling to the point where it started off where things were getting thrown, not from my my side either. Um, and then to, you know, my car getting smashed into or my wing mirror getting broke off. And then it would turn to a slap. Then it would turn into a punch. And then it would turn into... Like literally, like protecting my, uh, yeah. protecting myself. So I am literally just in a ball, getting beaten to the point where this one day I had to call for nine 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 because I couldn't breathe, and I I was scared that I was taking my last breaths. Wow. Um. Yeah. And, and the ambulance from, came. Yeah. From that moment, you managed to get out, or no, no. I didn't. Um, unfortunately, it was him blaming me for things that were happening where I then felt it was my fault and I deserved. I got that far into this pit that I ended up feeling like I deserved to be treated like this because it was my fault. And it became so normal in that environment for me to have things smashed up or my stuff broken that... I was thinking, oh my god, like I'm such a bad. It was because of me, or I didn't, I didn't clean the bathroom the way he liked the bathroom cleaned, or I didn't go and do something that needed to be done. I didn't walk the dogs, and then it came to the point where it was getting worse and worse. Um, at this point, my family, you know, looking back, it, my family couldn't do anything. My family were there trying, literally tried to help me, and when you love somebody and you are, your mental mind is so weak, mm -hmm. I just thought the person that made it bad can make it better. And that was the problem. I just wanted him to make it better because he'd hit me. I want you to make it better mm -hmm. and make me feel okay. 
and it's so you power you feel powerless right yeah because like you said which is very which hit me gave me goosebumps as well when you went it went from care which i thought was care but it was control mm. oh, flipping those seas from care to control and then obviously someone taking charge of your mind and your emotions to a point where you think it's your fault mm. and there's nothing you can do about it that's pure manipulation the only way I got out of that as well was um, I actually thought that if a man puts his hands on me, that would be the first thing for me to get away. And because I'd watched my father do that, I thought if a man ever does that to me, I'm gone. But because I was leered into it, yeah, it was like I didn't see it. I was blinded by it. And it was when a woman from my gym actually came to me and told me that she'd been meeting up with him and he'd been messaging her and then I asked her, I told her the relationship that I was in and I asked her if she could come to my house. I said, he won't believe me. She didn't have messages, she deleted them. She actually come to my house and confronted him because he told her that he was going to leave me. Wow. And that's, that's the only, I even rang the Samaritans. I was in such a dark place I've rang the Samaritans say, asking them what to do. After a three-hour conversation, the man said to me, he didn't say anything on the phone. After three hours, he said, I think you've made your mind up. And then I left. Wow. So you actually thought to yourself, I need help. I need to seek help. I need to talk to someone. I need to get get this done because it's there's mm. no way out otherwise. No. Wow. So you um, make this phone call. What makes you sort of get out for good or was it just the phone call when it someone came and, and it helped you out call. or it was crazy because um I had my little cousin Chloe and um she was like it was like I was like a little sister she was and I remember messaging her and she was actually on the bus to Paris or France or something and I messaged her and I said do you think I should leave and um she she said it would really make me happy if you did and she was still so she was in school and it was just I had such a close bond with her that I just thought okay now it's it, okay mustered some, the strength yeah such a powerful message because you're reaching out to people and they're just confirming what you already know deep down but you can't see and it's just that confirmation or that affirmation of yeah you need to go that finally um led you to to leaving, right? Mm. Did you just get, how I did, did you and just go up and go? I actually, um, I got up and I went to my mum's and the worst thing about it, I had my two dogs and I love my dogs so much mm. and it absolutely broke my heart that I had to leave my dogs. It was just like, if you go, then I'm keeping the dogs and all of these kind of things. Yeah, and just trying to keep that, keep something keep from you. Keep that control. Yeah, keep that control. That's it. Knowing that my dogs were mm. my everything. Yeah. And it was like, I used to like put them in the car, we'd go for walks. I'd take them to KFC drive through yeah. for as a treat. <laughs> like, just crazy. Like, I was a crazy dog lover. <laughs> and to that point where, even at that point, I had to sit down with myself and say, this could be your life. We are talking your life. You... How many times are you going to keep getting whacked in the face or thrown or whatever? Like, this is... And he's cheated now. Mm. Yeah, done. Girl, your dignity, your Mm self-respect, get up Mm -hmm. and leave. Go. Whatever materialistic shit's there, we leave materialistic stuff. Take your dignity Mm -hmm. of what you've got left of it Mm -hmm. and go back. And you're willing to sacrifice, you know, your your pets at this stage, the dogs. You're out. Um, Does your life start turning around automatically does it start turning around in that moment that you leave as in did you you feel the weight off your shoulders did you or was it a hard process to get used to retraining your mind that what was happening wasn't right yeah I was a nervous wreck I was was absolutely a nervous wreck because I didn't know at what point he was going to turn up are you going to turn up at my gym are you going to turn up at work Um, are you going to try and get me back am I strong enough to then say no like enough's enough And then it got to that point where I had such a good support system around me, like my mum, my friends, my family, my brother, everybody was just strong around me. And it was like I wanted to make them proud that I did it. Mm -hmm. Then it was nobody. I wasn't doing Christmases and everything with my family. 
Um, I wanted to make them proud. I was happy to then start going shopping with my mum again and seeing my brother. And it was just, I thought that that was love over here, that I was embedded in of like protection and care. And then when I actually went back, I was just like, oh my God, I'm being saturated with love because these people want to see me win. They want to see me happy. Mm -hmm. They want to see you become a better version of who you are. They want to see you progress in life. So you, you... Grow up, you've been through the mill, uh, relationships, really bad relationships. Your world's almost crumbling around you. You get out, your life starts to turn around, you start to feel what love is, then all of a sudden you meet Ashley. Um, How does that change your life? So me and Ashley were just friends. So we had the same friendship circle. So we'd kind of go out for shishas together, like grab food, desserts. Like we'd just kind of all be together. Um, And then... I'd known Ashley for like a long, long time. We're from the same area. So it was never a thing of like, oh, we, we're yeah. chatting to like say, hey, you're a fee or yeah, whatever. Yeah. It, wasn't, it, wasn't, it was it wasn't no, it like... absolutely <laughs> wasn't that story. It just became um to the point where sometimes there'd be like ten of us together. And um it become to the point where he started doing like it was just being nice, but because I hadn't seen a male role be kind and nice it was kind of like but this was even with women Mm -hmm. it was like oh my god like everyone's so like it's like my eyes were opening and I was absorbing this abundance of like laughter again and it was like making me feel like alive and like just like new lease of life yeah yeah Yeah. and then like Ashley was so fern as well and then I had a shop which was in Nanita and it was I had a a hair and tanning shop so then people used to come into my shop kind of of Essexy really Mm -hmm. and then like he'd come and get his tan a little sense of community it's lovely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he'd come and get his tan and um, he's a tan he's a tan and then like the lads would come in and then they'd get food so people would be sitting in the salon chairs and eating food so it was kind of like that vibe and then it unfolded into points of like people weren't able to go to the cinema or is anyone free? Do you want to go cinema? And I said, like, I'm just letting you know, like, this isn't a date, is it? To the point where I actually wore trainers and a twin set tracksuit. And a bit of hoodie. <laughs> yeah, do you know, to like give that vibe, like I've not got my heels on, I haven't got some tight jeans <laughs> yeah, on, like yeah. trying to snatch in the waist. Yeah, just like, none of that. None of that. I'm going to make myself the least appealing as yeah. possible. Yeah, just and I'm just let rolling. You know. Yeah, I'm just yeah. rolling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just rolling to the cinema Love with that. my brethren, okay? Love like, that. that is it. Love that. Yeah, and then even to the point when we finished the cinema and we pulled up, um, at my mum's house at the time I was living there and I kind of just I actually felt awkward I thought oh my god like, I'm going to get out of the car quick we we laughed about it like mm. when we got into a relationship because yeah. it was like I got out that day and I thought he, he ain't going to think that he can kiss me <laughs> like, he, like he definitely don't think that he can try it that. so I pulled up so we didn't ever like cross that line of friendship either. I like got out of the car and I was like, all right, and see you later. Even with my normal friends, I just sit there and chill for a minute, have a little chat or whatever. No, I got up and I thought, because I just maybe sensed something that he could possibly. And I just thought, because I come out of that relationship that was so intense, I just thought, what are the boys like out here now? Do they just try their luck or whatever? But like, I'm out of here. So yeah, yeah. happened like that. And then we unfolded gradually into me recognising the kindness that he was given, the affection. He's actually not what you see on TV. He's actually a real like family guy. And that started impressing me. Yeah. So and he actually carried my mom's bags from my shop to a car. From Come on, Lidl, that must have so been the sign. That, that must have signed. That was that was a winner. That was, that, that's, that was that's, a winner. That's when he that's yeah. when he uh, captured your heart. Yeah. Um, so he carries your mom's bags. He's captured your heart. You two obviously then go from from a uh, friendship to a relationship, and um, you fall pregnant. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that moment. When do you realise that you're pregnant and who uh, who did you tell first? Yeah, so we um, we actually was waiting and planning. We was planning and planning and planning um, and actually struggled at a certain point, do you know, to think, I actually thought, like, as soon as you come off the pill, naively, that you think that you're just going to get pregnant and yeah. it's like, it doesn't work no, it's like still in that. the system, you've got to yeah, go through the like, cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah of, of everything. So it was just kind of like checking the apps and just seeing timings and like getting OCD with it. And then um, one day, he, I was just like tired and fatigued. He told me to take a pregnancy test and I just thought, 
I was like, Ash, I'm not pregnant. I'm just tired. I'm run down. I've been working my ass off. Like, I'm just run down. And he was, like, insistent, me getting one. So we had um, a co-op just around the corner from where our apartment was. So we went out and got one, come back, and then I did the test. I even left it on the side, and he said, can I go and check it? And I said... I was like, yeah, like to go, go on. I just yeah. knew that I just knew that I wasn't. I just want to get some sleep right now. Yeah, I was just <laughs> chilling. I was just chilling, and then he walks into the living room and he's like, "Do you know, like when you have that, like, oh, I'm taking the piss kind of look." Yeah, yeah. It was kind of like he had that look on his face, and I was just like, "What?" And he was like, "Nah, you are." And I was like. No, and he was like, nah, Saf, you are, you actually are, like, pushing it like like you are. You think that you might have got a pen and put the second line in yeah, or something? You know, something yeah, something yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. And I was just literally blown away. Like, we had been planning and waiting for that moment. He drank, obviously I couldn't drink then when I knew, he drank uh, into the night. We had music on, we were dancing, we were so happy. It was just, we kept it a secret. Okay. for a little bit and then December came because it was like near Christmas and then we decided to do the um, do the scan and make sure everything's cool first yeah. we actually did the scan and got it printed and put it in cards for our parents and um, yeah for Christmas so it, we did it as a Christmas card so yeah we literally just told like immediate immediate family and it was just incredible like the the family was my mom was blown away because I didn't even tell her I was trying yeah I just wanted it to be like here you go here's a surprise yeah yeah <laughs> um uh, my brother absolutely over the moon um Ashley's mom his dad everybody and then on Christmas day we told the remaining the family like aunties cousins um we told all of them and like everybody loved us together we was always around visiting families houses we were just our best days together were when we would be in the car just going to visit all family members yeah. and we just dot around and have a cup of tea over there and that like we really enjoyed that and how how was your pregnancy physically and psychologically? Was it was it a difficult pregnancy or was it quite a quite a, an easy one? I think because I'm when I'm doing something, I just get stuck in. My mm -hmm. head just gets stuck in. So I was absolutely shitting myself when I was pregnant. I thought, oh my god, I've got. I used to find it really strange. I've got something a human growing inside of me. So that psychologically it used to make me think, what? And then like feeling like the it's like popcorn popping of like movement. That's how I can describe it of. And it was just like learning how to get over the fact that there's there's another life being growing inside of me and then this is all going on. So it was all so new and strange, but I was like loving every moment of it. And then even to the point where I was painting, I was painting as Alia's bedroom. I was getting all of her bedroom ready. Um, downstairs in the living room, I was up on ladders painting. Um but we was in oh, lockdown as well at that same time. How was you? Yeah, so oh, we it was during in, the pandemic. Yeah, so it was during the pandemic. Wow. So I was actually, I actually felt robbed of my pregnancy because I wasn't able to go out and go and buy baby clothes and go yeah, and do all of these things. You. And then obviously everyone was in their own houses. So it was just like secluded. So that's why I was doing all the oh, painting and right. getting the house so ready and stuff because you. I was just locked in the house, basically. We all were. How did that affect you? It affected me quite a lot because I, um, I just feel like I didn't have anywhere to go. I don't have anywhere to like, I didn't have like friends to go and sit and chat with and have that togetherness. We've all felt it, haven't yeah, we? Do you know, like course. even just the visits, yeah, even, even the bonding and the conversations, it was all over the phone. So it didn't feel personal. So I kind of felt like I was on my pregnancy journey by myself technically and I suppose were you petrified that if you caught Covid the baby would catch yeah. Covid and so did you were you quite a de defensive mama bear where you're like don't yeah. come near me yeah. you know it's like literally yeah like genuinely <laughs> was like yeah so protective of you. So, and it does it I suppose when you look at it like that it, it does rob you of your pregnancy um, because yeah it's meant to be that moment of you know, where everyone comes together, you know, your mum's got the hand on the belly, yeah. you know, Ashley's listening into the baby, the friends are all annoying you by poking your belly. Yeah, and, you I know, think I maybe I escaped that, that part because <laughs> I actually would just think, like, get off. Yeah, no, yeah, get off, you know, don't, don't touch me.
the day that Azalea was born. Mm. Can you, if it's not too painful, can you no, take no, me, no, can no, you, absolutely. Can you take me back to that? Day? So it was a moment where obviously we was in the pandemic, but we were kind of coming out of it as well. Um, I had um, my aunties, the family. There was like everyone just itching to get to you yeah basically (laughs) um and even just outside you know like everyone was just happy that you could finally have so many in the household and whatever so everyone was there and then um I was just counting the breaths because I didn't want to go into hospital and stay in hospital because I just had this thing about um sleeping in hospital overnight I just didn't have that enjoyment so I was just like wait till that last second and I lived down the road from the hospital so it was kind of like let's fly in the car and get Mm -hmm. down which is exactly what happened and um and then I wanted Ashley by my side as well so he could experience and me have somebody there for me um the whole the whole process so we're now in hospital we're in the room I'm on gas and air Ashley's beside me I mean, I've literally got that gas and air stuck to my face to the point where the nurse, she unplugged it from the machine because she was telling me to take a breath. And it was just like, I knew when she unplugged it, I was just like, pet, <laughs> it back, on. Do you know? not mess yeah. with yeah. a pregnant woman. Yeah. I have been caught. Yeah. I, it, it's, it's the same with my wife. I, I made the mistake um, of telling my wife just to push. No. Yeah, and she was like, the eyes. And I was like, because it was like me, I was like by her side. She was squeezing my hand. My hand was like, it's like, and I just thought, I'm never ever going to say that again. Note to oneself <laughs> if we haven't, you know, it's like, I can, so I know yeah. what you mean. It's like, give me that air. Yeah. I need that air. Um, so you're in a lot of pain at this stage, yeah. right? And then Ashley um, also takes the gas and air because his back's aching because he's leaning over the bed because I'm telling him, like, don't sit down. Like, I need to hold your hand. Mm -hmm. Then he's taking the gas and air off me. (laughs) He's having it for himself as well, um, which he obviously loved. And um, to that point where the gas and air was just no longer working, um, to the point where I had to have an epidural. Um, I ticked yes to have an epidural because my midwife had said to me, if you don't tick yes they won't be able to give it yeah. So if you, you, you it, can yeah. say no after. So I had the um, epidural and then, oh my God, the relief, 30 minutes was great. Nah, it didn't work for me. It didn't work. There's in so many and so many chances that it won't work for somebody and that was me. That's right. To the point then where I had to go and get rushed into an emergency C-section Um, I was in labour for like 10 hours, 11 hours and I was like one centimetre left for dilation and I just thought, great. And then they've come in, right, we need emergency C-section. At this point, I'd had that many like gas and air and I've had all of the drugs or whatever that they give me. I don't even know what they give me. I'm knocked out at that point. (laughs) And um, I'm being wheeled into this room now to have a C-section and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm now going to get cut open. I was petrified. So I've not had no prep for a C-section. So I've just had prep for just a natural birth. That it was what I wanted. And then I'm in this room. And because my body, Ashley, wasn't there at the time, he was in the waiting room to keep them in the waiting room. So I kind of have to prep you. Then my body was going into shock where I was just literally just shaking off the um, gas and air and obviously the epidural. And I couldn't sit still. So they was telling me if I'm not still... Ashley's not going to be allowed to come in the room and they're going to have to put me to sleep to deliver Azalea. So I was like, I cannot rob Ashley of his chance of meeting his first child for the first time and having that experience. Like, I can't do that to him. So my thoughts for me were secondary. It was just, I know he's in the corridor. So I'm now shouting like, get Ashley now. The nurses are looking at me as if to be like, well, look, like, this isn't, she is a nutter. And then because uh, I used to like work in the she's dentist. Not, she's, she's pregnant. <laughs> yeah. She's not a nutter. Yeah. She's just pregnant. <laughs> and we used to deal with like, I used to um, do be a dental nurse and we used to do like clients that were, patients, sorry, that were sedated. Or I literally felt my hand being lifted up. And I knew at that point Fine. they're trying to put a drip in me to, to knock me out to sleep. Yeah. And I was just like, grab my hand down. I was like, get 
Ashley, now! Mm -hmm. Screaming, like literally pointing my hands down. He can hear me down the corridor. He was like, Saf, that was so embarrassing. And I was just like, do you realise what I was going through yeah, in that exactly, room for yeah. you, mate? Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> to the point where I'm I was like, doing this for you. <laughs> yeah, this is for you, like not for me. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like at this point now, like holding everything, like literally stiffed myself so I wasn't trembling. And then they brought him in and he was just like coming as if to be like, oh my God, what is going on in that room? And then Azalea was welcomed into the room. But let me add before that, that C-section felt like a washing machine. Do you know these metaphors that I have popcorn mm -hmm. pop in? Yeah. When that C-section was happening, it felt like a washing machine in my stomach. That that feeling and like being tugged, I felt like there was a crane on top of me pulling me. Wow. It was it was insane, that feeling. Uh, absolutely insane. So would you say quite a traumatic um yeah. Delivery. Uh, yeah. Try, uh, quite a traumatic Yeah, experience. someone could have come along with a frying pan and whacked me around the yeah, eyes and I wouldn't have given a damn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, so this is no smooth process no, for you. No. Um, and the couple of things that I've just picked up on, which is, you know, you almost robbed of your pregnancy and, you know, oh, then you go into a very traumatic delivery and then Azalea comes and... She takes her first breath with her mum. Ashley's there, right? Yes. And her, yes. And, and, and her, and her dad. Um, how are you feeling in that moment? I was so spaced out. I have to be honest here. Yeah? I was so spaced out. Ashley's, all I can hear, it's like everything just, it was like I knew that she was safely brought into yeah. this world. So it's like my body just went, <sighs> Yeah, like a do. relief. And then it was like, I started hearing things like, as if you were going to faint, you know, like like the noises become like, mm -hmm. it was yeah. like I was hearing that. And um, and then he's like, Saf, it's is Azalea, Azalea's here, like this. And then I gave her a kiss. And then I shouted, even at this point, to Ashley. I was like, go and cut the umbilical cord. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sent him on his way to go and cut the umbilical cord with Azalea. And it was inside, it was just like, I felt so happy that my baby had finally been delivered into the world and I was a mummy. Wow. Yeah. And uh, after the umbilical cords cut, do you remember that moment when you're back in the recovery room and you're actually starting to feel normal? You're starting to, you know, mm. come to, you're no longer on all these drugs. You know, the, the trauma and the drama of, yeah. the, uh, of the situation is sort of everything's calmed down. Can you remember that calm after, yes. after the storm? Um, I do because it was still um, the hospitals had re certain requirements that they have That's so right. Ashley had to leave and go home and then um, me and Azalea was in hospital then for a couple of days and at that point of just feeling relaxed and having my little girl in my arms and like just watching her mouth That's open in and like her eyes just trying to flick in and open and look at me to digest and drink in every moment of that was just the most incredible, surreal, beautiful feeling that you can't even describe that moment. The really, really hard question that I'm gonna gonna ask you, and you feel free not to answer it, but um, receiving the news only weeks later that Azalea has an aggressive form of leukemia, and that really, really aggressive form of leukemia. What, what I can only imagine, but what, what, what I can't imagine, but what was when you received that news? What was it? Eight weeks after she was yeah, born. Yeah, eight weeks after she was born. Yeah. What, Take me back to that moment if you can. Yeah, no, I can. Um, and I like to speak about it openly because I feel like it just creates that awareness. Um, I have a background of medic, like medical background. Um, you change a baby's nappy a hundred times a day. Azalea was having cold type symptoms, so I was taking her to the doctor's. Um, just things that the doctor was saying, you know, maybe, you know, I was breastfeeding, so it's like, oh, maybe she needs, like, milk, so give her milk as well, or she's maybe hungry, or... So there was all these things that I was going through after, looking back, after four weeks, um, that I was going through quite a lot. I was think even thinking at the time, like, God, this is a lot, but I've never been a mum before, so I'm just rolling with the punches here. Um, to the point where 
the doctor had said to me that everything's okay. He'd looked over her. Um, it's just, this is just a baby just coming into the world. We're just figuring it out. Um, to this day where I was changing a nappy and I mean, I'm like OCD. I like everything clean. So as soon as that line came in the nappy, I would, that nappy would be changed. Like she would yeah. never be sitting mm-hmm. in a crappy nappy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, so probably within a couple of hours of having a last nappy changed or 10 minutes or whatever it were, um, changed the nappy and as a new mom I used to always have my camera like wanting to snap every Mm -hmm, moment mm -hmm. I've opened um her nappy and then she just got like this really cute smile on her face and I was like oh where's my phone like I need to get a picture of this and then I noticed um as I was taking a nappy off that she had a bruise in the inside of her groin and I thought, oh, that's strange. But everyone was bouncing her around because she was having a cold or, you know, like you're just trying to settle the baby. And then I seen this bruise and I was just like, why is Azalea's got, got a bruise on her? At the time I was like, with Ashley, I don't know, family members were around. And then um, I just thought that's really strange. But when I put my finger over the bruise, there was a lump. Because of my medical background... I know that if there's a lump behind a bruise, it means there's an infection there. There's something going on in the body and it's an alarm Mm. bell, basically. And I thought, oh, maybe, okay, this is weird. Then I look back at the picture of what I'd taken of her just before I started changing the nappy. And then I seen like mottling on the skin, like the skin changes, but I couldn't see it to the eye, but I could see it on the phone. I was thinking, yeah, this is strange. And then when I started looking, I could actually start seeing it because you, you're really analysing it now. And then I thought, this is strange. So I emailed the um, the GP and said that I found a bruise. Um, but before this as well, I'd found blood spots in Azalea's nappy when I was changing her bum and took the pictures, sent that to the doctors as well. No, it's fine. It's just, it's it's, it's, it, it's normal, basically. So then I took it again and I said, she, well, she just had a wee. So there's a couple of times now where I've sent pictures to the GP because it's lockdown yeah. rules um, where blood, blood, bruise, bruises, cold type symptoms, mm. all of these things mottled collectively, skin. mottled skin. I'm like, nah. So basically, cut a long story short, um, my mum was actually looking after Azalea at the time because me and Ashley, on that day, um, it was kind of one of them things like, take Azalea to my mum, she lives around the corner. Mum wanted me and Ashley to have some time together yeah, after course. having baby yeah. and Ashley had some work to do. So we kind of just went and thought we'd have a couple of hours there. Mum looks after Azalea. I'd said that I'd message the, um, the, the doctors and whatever, you know, as precaution. And basically, my mum took it upon herself to actually take Azalea to the hospital. And um, then I got a phone call off the doctor, because I'm in Manchester, my mum's there already. She's just doing the mum thing, like, oh, yeah, do you know what? I'm just going to do my yeah. own little check just to make sure mm. she's okay. And I got a phone call to say, um, you need to take Azalea to A&E. And I'm literally, like, my heart's thudding on the phone to the doctors. I'm like, why? And it's like, just be careful, just just to be sure and just get a checked over, I go to a and E. rang my mum, mum, you need to take Azalea to a and E. I'm already here. And I'm like, what do you mean you're already there? Why, what's happening? And I'm obviously in Manchester and I'm literally, like, ringing Ashley. We're in, um, it gone, it popped somewhere. We're both in the car and we shot straight down to the hospital and when we walked into the hospital, um, Azalea was there with um, all the doctors, nurses, a massive team around her, obviously wondering what's going on. We've been told that a white cells are at 200. This is all alien. I don't know mm. what this means. They think it's sepsis. Um, so my heart, I'm literally crying all the way down to the hospital. And then to the point where the, the doctor sits us both down and says... Um, Unfortunately, I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to tell you this, but she's got leukaemia and um, you need to go into Birmingham Children's Hospital now and it's a very severe case. So, yeah, catapulted into Birmingham Children's Hospital. Wow. So literally... Yeah. One minute you just think it's a random checkup, and then, that, then it's like all hell breaks loose you're there and you go into this hospital and I don't want to 
cover too much of the trauma of 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 you know I know she was a chirpy little soul and Absolutely. she's always a fighter and the you go into the hospital and you don't come back out basically do you? Six months. Six months. Yeah. I think we had like two weeks out of six months mm. where we was allowed to go home. Oh, I mean, always in and yeah. out, in, in and out. Mm-hmm. And you find out this at eight weeks and then at eight months. Yeah, she passed uh, away. Zelia passed away. That story is, you know, infallible for me. You know, I'm a father myself, you know. But what's really powerful about having you here is how do you get over that? How do you get through that? And what are you doing today to keep yourself from not falling into into a very, very dark hole? Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. Never did I think I would be sat here now being able to help and inspire so many people. Um, the fact that my daughter has given me a second life, I'd say. I feel like I'm in my second life. And I feel like watching her inspire millions of people around the world seeing like huge monuments light up around the world showed me that the world is my oyster she showed me that the power is within you as a person and in your darkest times you get the f up and you continue to fight is that what you do Mm. you just you just get the f up right because the moment you don't you're done. Yeah. Is that right? Absolutely. So you when need you... to get up all the time, right? Mm. And you need to, and you need to, you say, get the F up. It's like, get the F up. Well, for what purpose? To, to help others. Yeah. So for me, it's about giving back. For me, it's about expanding the mind of myself, the muscles in my mind. I get great achievement of delivering new avenues for different people, watching um, my platform and seeing people getting up, going to do driving lessons again because they've watched me on TikTok live. Um, I'm having bad days sometimes. So sometimes I I, I put measures in place. I do a 10 o'clock alarm. I'm walking through how, can't get up, can't shower, can't even think to uh, put clothes on in that day. Then I set myself a 10 o'clock alarm and that is... When that alarm goes off, that is the time to get the F up. So we go and take a shower and then it unfolds my day. Then it makes me feel like, right, I want to be powerful. I appreciate each day that I get. What impact can I make in each of these days that I've got? So I don't know how long my life's going to be, but what impact are we creating? I love helping people, watching people expand and be incredible and a better version of themselves is something that inspires me. So the fact that I've started hearing people say to me, oh, my God, I watch you, you're so inspirational. Oh, my God, yeah. how would you do that? And oh, my God, how would you my do that? My wife being one of them. <laughs> and I just, I don't see that at myself. Maybe I should give myself a little bit more credit, but no, I don't see that. All I see is Sophia surviving. But me surviving is helping other people. It's mm. powerful. Do you know what? I, I don't envy you I sort of fear for you because you've got no choice but to get the F up Mm. because not like many people when they don't they just the moment you don't you're you're done I'm scared you're you're, you're done and I see that in Ashley as well Mm. keeps on going and going and going and I think you're going to have to stop one day but you can't because the moment you do and I fear for you I I sort of think wow you've got no option no but to get the F up, what happens one day when, when, you, when you don't? So I have a different avenue and, and this is also something that I've really thought about long and hard. And I think because I've worked on my mental capacity from rock bottom, I feel like I know when I get to different stages and through having therapy, how I cope with them. So for me, turning my pain into purpose was setting up the Azalea Foundation to help so many of the children and families however that helps me but on my bad bad days I learn how to sit in that pain now I learn to take a moment for myself so I now start putting things into place like I do hair masks I do skincare I sit in my house and put on my favorite podcasts yeah. I I do the cleaning I I get lost in doing things for my house and for me so I'm no longer scared that I'm going to hit that 
hit that wall of not wanting to be here anymore because I really, in my darkest times, have taught myself that life is precious. Children and many other people out there are fighting for their lives. How could I take this gift so stupidly? Yeah, like, yeah, How yeah. could I be so stupid so, yeah, and do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at the change that I'm making. Look yeah. how many people's lives I'm saving and helping. What about if I'm not here anymore? I'm here now because I feel like I'm a light on earth yep. and my daughter's a light in heaven. And it's it's time now that even if we're in them dark places, which I've been recently, and I've just thought, I turn pain into purpose. What am I going to do? I've just started doing my aesthetics again where I'm injecting. I've been in a lot of pain recently and just thought we need another task. Yeah, need so another I, purpose, right? Yeah, it's I need like another you've got purpose. the purpose, which is the Azalea Foundation, and that, and you've got Azalea there to guide you like that light from, from heaven. And you've mentioned something, I don't know if you realise that you mentioned it, but you said, Azalea gave me a second life. Mm. You don't waste that life. No. Right now, you talk about a purpose, and I you know, try and process things as you're saying them, but when you said that, I was just like, wow, that's really really powerful because you can almost go right she's given me i'm not wasting that life that she's given me she sacrificed hers for what you know however yeah. you look at it yeah i'm making the most of it not only for me for millions of people out there but for azalea as well mm. you know in that light that you mentioned down here and there that, that always comes together right yeah I, I always light a candle at a garden that's a resting place every single yeah. day since the day she's passed she's had a lot she's had a candle there and um, I don't really speak about the candle um, so much but that is my light it's like my direction it's still here on earth and I'm here and I'm keeping that light going on earth mm -hmm. for, for your name for your legacy for millions of people to help and inspire them every day but I just I'm so proud that I can I, I couldn't actually have a conversation properly I couldn't like collect myself and my thoughts and my feelings to be able to deliver them and now I'm at a point now where I'm feeling empowered I'm feeling strong and I'm feeling like I can articulate things so much more clearer for people to truly understand collectively that using my voice to be powerful so other people can get up yeah. be gentle with yourself though because we see so much physical, like you're so amazing at all of these physical things yeah. with your body that so much comes down to the mind. Yeah. And like sometimes I think like, oh, do you know what? I can't do them challenges that Ashley does with a yeah. foundation. Like I'm not fit enough. But it's like, but look how broad mentally, I'm helping so, mentally yeah. as well. 100%. And that is it because the moment your mind gives up, the rest of the body follows. Mm. But if the body says no and the mind convinces the body to keep going, it will keep going. Mm. So it's the actual, the mental strength. And that's why I've got you on here and people don't realise how mentally strong and resilient you must be, not only for what you've been through recently with your daughter, but for your upbringing. That's why it's so important to, to get that get mm. that um, picture of your upbringing because you are one resilient, mentally resilient woman. And to be here now, as you put it, with a, with a new life moving forward, you are inspiring mil uh, millions, including my wife. My wife is just like, she's the one, like I said, I've got to thank her for bringing you oh, on I here. I love her. Thank you so um, much. Because she, she, she saw it. But um, also from my mother's perspective as well, you know, it's like you're, you're ultimately you're still working for Azalea. You're I still am. her mother. You're still making her proud. You're still doing things for her in light mm -hmm. for other people. Yeah. And keep spreading that message. Thanks ever so much for coming on. Honestly, it's been amazing sitting opposite you, chatting with you and uh, seeing the mother of a beautiful uh, baby that um, touched all of our hearts and continue to touch all of our hearts. Keep living that life, okay, because those lights are aligning. They are Thank sinking, you. they are touching and they're doing the world of good out there. Honestly, your message is such a powerful one and this will only enhance it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. To find out more about the Azalea Foundation and to donate, head to theazaleafoundation.com or you can find the link in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining me on Head Game. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of our incredible stories and leave me a review wherever you're listening. I'm Matt Middleton. Catch you again next time.